Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, the administration, faculty, and staff of Gordon College, I welcome all of you to this momentous and joyous occasion. The inauguration of a new president is always a very special occasion in the life of a college and marks both a new beginning and an opportunity to affirm the institution's heritage. The presence of distinguished delegates from academia and other institutions and organizations reminds us that as a college, it does not stand alone. It participates in and bears responsibility for a larger society of which it is a part. Thank you all for joining us at this memorable convocation. There are many distinguished guests with us who have come a long ways. I cannot greet or name all of them, but I will name a few. I'll begin with um, Michael and Rebecca's parents are both here, all four of them. Um, that's uh, Ken and Susan Lindsay, uh, Michael's parents, and Rebecca's parents, Ronnie and Anne Elizabeth Ward. In addition, the grandmothers of both are here. And that's uh, Lucille Lindsay for Michael and Mary Margaret Robertson for Rebecca. And we do welcome them. In addition, we have Dr. Dennis Hollinger, president of Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, Dr. Paul R. Kortz, president of Council of Christian Colleges and Universities, uh, Dr. Nathan O'Hatch, president Wake Forest University, Dr. Richard J. Mao, President Fuller Theological Seminary, Doc, Mr. Dr. Mr. George Gallup, Chairman Emeritus Gallup Poll, Dr. Richard Gross, sixth President of Gordon College, Dr. R. Justin Carlberg, the seventh President of Gordon College, and Price Harding from Car Carter Baldwin, who worked very, very hard managing the search for the presidential search team. I'd like to recognize also my fellow trustees, those here on the platform, and those of you who are standing before me, uh, who, for their ongoing commitment to Gordon College, for their sacrifice, for their loyal support. Nothing like this, no convocation or celebration like this can come together without the help of many hands, many unsung heroes, and for them, I say thank you. I say thank you to all the staff and the faculty of Gordon College who have put this together day by day, hour by hour. Finally, I ask you just to wait patiently as Dr. Kerry Tibbles leaves us in the invocation. Please um, bow your hearts um, with me as I pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather together today on this joyful occasion, we pause with thankful hearts to acknowledge you, creator of heaven and earth, and our personal savior. Thank you for your continued faithfulness and constant presence at Gordon College and in each of our lives. Over the past 122 years of Gordon's long history, you've continually brought men and women to this place who were devoted followers of you. Here, young men and women have grown in Christlikeness and become servant leaders for your kingdom. Faculty have devoted their lives to the pursuit of your truth and the mentorship of the next generation, and we praise and thank you for all that has been accomplished here. In your faithfulness, you have raised up skilled and dedicated leaders to further your purposes for this college. With deep gratitude to you, we pause to acknowledge the faithful service of, service of the past presidents of Gordon, particularly President Gross and President Carlberg present with us today. 
men chosen by you who selflessly led Gordon with wisdom and discernment over many years. We ask your continued blessing and provision for this season of their lives. Today, we are also so thankful for the decades of Gordon alumni scattered along around the globe, building your kingdom in so many diverse places and ways, and pray that they will continue to be salt and light, bringing your hope to this hurting world. Thank you for the current students that have gathered here. Strengthen the faculty and staff. Give them courage and creativity as they encourage this next generation of your followers. As we look to the future, I thank you that in your providence, you have brought Michael and Rebecca to Gordon. I pray that each day they will continue to grow in their love for you and in turn, love those that you have placed in their care. Watch over them, give them patience, understanding and peace as they move forward with their calling on their lives. I thank you, God, for each person here today, longtime faithful friends of Gordon and each new person you have brought into the Gordon family today. May we all join together as members of the body of Christ for your glory and honor. On this important day, we rededicate our lives and this college to you, God. May we be instruments of your grace. May your Holy Spirit continue to transform us. May we never take for granted the vast blessings and gifts you have brought us. Forgive us when we do, and may we instead dedicate ourselves to your service. Oh God, because without you we are not able to please you, mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now, if you can join the orchestra, we will sing Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, page 16. reading from Jeremiah chapter 29. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. 
plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you in exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. The word of the Lord. President Lindsay and the Gordon College community, I bring you greetings from your sister school down the street, Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. For the first 80 of our 122 years, we were, of course, one institution. Though the seminary and college became distinct in 1969 with the merger of Gordon Divinity School and Conwell School of Theology, we continue to share much. Beyond our shared heritage, we have partnerships that strengthen each other's institution. We have faculty teaching at the other's institution. Our students employ each other's library. Our students, faculty, and staff from the seminary are more physically fit, thanks to your wonderful Bennett Center. <laughs> we share some common donors. And we have close personal friendships that we all cherish. But there is one other reality that we have in common, a commitment to a framework and a center for education, even in the midst of a highly pluralistic and fragmented world. The historic trend in American higher education has been to minimize or abandon that framework or centeredness for providing coherence motivation, and substantive intellectual guidance. Against the cultural odds, we have both maintained it, that center being the historic Christian faith. Michael, I know that you and I and our colleagues are committed to continuing that kind of education even against the grain of larger societal forces. I pray that as institutions, we may help each other flourish in that common commitment. And on a more personal note, Michael, your predecessor, Judd, was a great help to me over the past three years in my tenure at the seminary. In fact, just last week, I gave him a call for some advice. And I hope that we, and I include our spouses, Rebecca and Marianne, can be there for each other in the sometimes lonely role of a president when we each need a listening ear or an outside perspective. I pray that we can continue and encourage each other to creatively and relevantly, with fidelity, carry on the great heritage that we share in common. May God richly bless you as the new president of Gordon College. I bring you greetings, President Lindsay, on behalf of nearly 200 member institutions from 24 countries around the world that form the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities. Gordon College has been a strong leader for the Council from its inception, and we look forward to your contributions as you follow in the Gordon tradition. Mr. President, the Council is committed to helping you lead Gordon to maintain your Christ-centered mission helping Gordon continue to refine and enhance your total institutional program, academic, extracurricular, athletic, social, spiritual, in an extraordinary Christ-centered way 
that truly transforms lives, shaping and molding students into the image and likeness of Christ by faithfully relating scholarship and service to biblical truth. President Lindsay, you have been selected president leader of this Christ-centered college, and thus you are the chief servant of all the Gordon College family. You have a heavy responsibility for the stewardship of the sacred trust to ensure that the college fulfills its Christ-centered mission. But I assure you, you will also receive great joy and fulfillment as you commit yourself to the Lord's work here. So it is both a high honor and an enormously humbling experience. President Lindsay is the leader of this highly respected college. Many will consider you among the intellectual elite of the evangelical movement. There's an old adage that it can be lonely at the top, but I think it is less true for those of us in the family of faith. For we have a friend closer than a brother who desires to walk this vocational life with you. And I urge you to keep a close intimacy with this dear friend, Christ Jesus our Lord. You will also stand on the shoulders of great saints who have built the foundation and nurtured Gordon to achieve the high level of reputation and success that the college enjoys today. But the flow of leadership continues. The Lord has uniquely prepared you for such a time as this, and we join in prayer for you as you begin this new chapter of service. He has provided a nurturing, supportive group of several hundred other presidents who walk a similar path and are available to encourage and support you and Gordon. Our Lord is faithful to provide all that you need for you and Rebecca and your family, and I pray that he will fill your cup to full and overflowing from his great storehouse of blessings as you take on this awesome responsibility. May God bless you. Dan Cho, and I am a member of the Gordon College Board of Trustees. It is my pleasure to read the letters of greeting from United States Senators Scott Brown and John Kerry. First, the letter from Senator Brown. Dear Dr. Lindsay, it is a privilege for me to congratulate you on your inauguration as the president of Gordon College. 
I am proud to have constituents like you who work rigorously in order to achieve their goals. Your strong will and dedication is commendable, and I am honored to recognize you for your hard work. Again, thank you for your service to the community, and I wish you the best of luck in all your future endeavors at Gordon College. Sincerely, Scott P. Brown. And now the letter from Senator Kerry. Dear President Lindsay, on this historic day, I wanted to offer my congratulations and warmest wishes on your inauguration as the eighth president of Gordon College. At this time of great challenge at home and in the world, leading an institution founded to shine the light of God's truth through the service of its graduates is a particularly important undertaking. For Gordon's 2,000 students and their families, your leadership is vital, particularly for the young people at an age when so many decisions to work out such a tangle of choices and possibilities whose consequences seem unknowable and yet life-shaping. For all those students here at Gordon, it's especially a pivotal time exploring their commitment to God, embarking on a journey to figure out how to lead a good life, how to translate their values, what you're passionate about, how you worship, and how you translate that into the daily fabric of your existence. It is also especially appropriate that Gordon College is located here in Wenham, it would be both impossible and inadvisable to separate the force and enormous power of faith from the history and intellectual foundation of Massachusetts. From the Pilgrims, to the Great Awakening, to the movements for social justice, civil rights, and peace that originated among the many religious-based campuses and faith communities of our state. In my own life, after a difficult period of religious alienation and questioning after the Vietnam War, one of the ways I returned to my own Catholicism, in fact, was at Boston College Law School when a Jesuit priest encouraged me to sit down again and reread St. Augustine's writings on the doctrine of just war, to bring Jesus into my moral and intellectual struggles rather than to keep him out. That is just one of the reasons why I especially value the role of a Christian college to help students develop their mind, body, and spirit, to be taught to live a life in service to others as Jesus lived his life. Gordon College is just such a place. On this special day for you and for all of Gordon College, it seems appropriate to remember a familiar story from the Gospel according to Mark, which reminds any Christian leader how to best translate faith into action. At a time when James and John were vying for influence and status, Jesus responds with an essential lesson. He contrasts greatness in the kingdom of God with Roman political power. While greatness in the Roman Empire is based on brute force, lording it over those less fortunate for the worst possible reason, simply because you can, Jesus reminds us that greatness in the kingdom of God is based on humble service, on being servant to all. Leadership of a special place like Gordon College is just such a kind of service, a form of Christian service, an expression of faith, and a commitment to live in the example of Jesus. To you on this beginning of your tenure, to all those at Gordon College, I send you all the best hopes for success and fulfillment, and look forward to sitting, sitting down and meeting with you later this month in Washington. Sincerely, John F. Carey. Dr. Nathan Hatch has had a distinguished career within higher education for nearly four decades. After graduating with a bachelor's degree from Wheaton College in Illinois, he matriculated into Washington University in St. Louis, earning both his master's and doctoral degrees. He has held postdoctoral fellowships at Harvard and Johns Hopkins universities and has been awarded research grants by the National Endowment for the Humanities and the American Council of Learned Societies. In 1975, he joined the History Department at Notre Dame. Over the next 30 years, he served in various faculty and administrative positions there. From 1980 to 83, he directed the Graduate Studies Department. During this period, he received the Paul Fenlon Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching. 
He went on to serve as the Associate Dean of Notre Dame's College of Arts and Letters, and in 1988, he became the college's acting dean. It was during this time that he founded and directed the Institute of Scholarship in the Liberal Arts. In 1989, he was appointed Vice President for Graduate Studies and Research. He spent his last nine years at Notre Dame, serving in the position of provost. As provost, he focused on several areas of academic improvement, including nurturing centers for academic excellence, revitalizing undergraduate education, and recruiting outstanding faculty. In July of 2005, Dr. Hatch accepted an invitation to serve as the 13th president of Wake Forest University, a position he currently holds. Dr. Hatch is regularly cited as one of the most influential scholars in the study of the history of religion in America. He received national acclaim for his 1989 book, The Democratization of American Christianity, in which he examines how the rise of religious groups in the early 19th century helped shape American culture and foster democracy. The book was chosen in a survey of 2,000 historians and sociologists as one of the two most important books in the study of American religion. His other books include The Sacred Cause of Liberty, Republican Thought in the Millennium in Revolutionary New England, and co-authored with historians George Marsden and Mark Knoll in 1983, The Search for Christian American. He has also co-edited several books, which include The Bible in America with Mark Knoll and Jonathan Edwards in the American Experience with Harry Stout. As impressive as these scholarly accomplishments are within the academy, taken in isolation, they only portray an incomplete picture of a man whom colleagues and students regularly describe as gracious, affable, approachable, a community leader. These qualities were evident in an event Dr. Hatch hosted this past March at Wake Forest, which involved 53 students setting up tents on the president's lawn and camping out. He and his wife relished the opportunity to informally get to know many of the students and play games with them. One student was quoted as saying, how many people can say they got to play basketball with their university's president? <laughs> These experiences can leave lasting impressions on students. This is a dimension of Dr. Hatch's vocation that needs to be recognized and celebrated. Please welcome Dr. Nathan Hatch as our guest speaker this afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am deeply honored to be here at Gordon College on this very special occasion. I have great appreciation and esteem for this institution and for your new president, Michael Lindsay. I am confident that this community under his leadership can advance its, its mission in very significant ways, building upon the strong leadership of Richard Gross and Judson Carlberg. The challenges before any institutions such as this are great, but I am confident that its opportunities are even greater, and Michael Lindsay is the right person to galvanize this community to fulfill its potential. Today we live in a world that is fascinated by leadership. Bookstores are stocked with handbooks and advice manuals on leadership, its principles, its paths, its laws, its secrets, even its soul. We can learn lessons from coaches, CEOs, tested Navy SEALs, even the leadership secrets of Attila the Hun. <laughs> and we have seen best-selling biographies of, of great American presidents detailing, often wistfully, how they faced and mastered the challenges of their time. John Adams, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Teddy, and Franklin Roosevelt. Yet we have never been more disheartened with leadership today as it is practiced. There is almost no sector today that leaders have not undergone withering criticism. Politics, law, finance, medicine, business, the church, and that's whether Roman Catholic, mainline, or evangelical. 
The country is going through one of its longest sustained periods of unhappiness and pessimism ever, a pollster recently noted. A majority of Americans today consider it unlikely that their children will lead better lives than they led. And few see leaders who can depict how we achieve a brighter tomorrow. Where are the examples of outstanding leaders of character that we wish our young people to follow? Unfortunately, popular culture today exalts few heroes to be emulated. Instead, it pulsates with the antics of the infamous, characters, if you will, a very different meaning of the same word, anti-heroes who break convention because they don't have it together. So many television shows focus on dark and dysfunctional characters, Breaking Bad, The Tudors, The Borgias, Weeds, Dexter, Mad Men, Boardwalk Empire, all fall in the tradition of Tony Soprano, which week after week beckons the audience to root for a flawed leader, not a person of character. The question for me as a citizen, as a person of faith, and as a university president is how do we form young people of real character, women and men who do the right thing because it springs from their own commitments and values. A Christian liberal arts college like Gordon has a double responsibility. You nurture students as Christians and you ground them in the liberal arts. You prepare young people to assume responsible positions throughout the professions in the church, in business, in education, in civil society. You have the high calling to fully form them as integral leaders. I find today that young people are whipsawed between competing values and priorities. At one level, they are noble and idealistic and very service oriented. But many also crave wealth and station, and they live in a culture that threatens to drown the better angels of their nature. Like a swollen river, the popular culture in which we live has a powerful, almost irresistible influence upon us through television, movies, music, advertising, tweets, and blogs. So this afternoon, I would like to spell out three essentials in nurturing leaders of character. And in each case, <clears throat> I think we must challenge this undertow of popular culture in the 20th century, in the 21st century, excuse me. First, we need leaders of purpose and commitment in a culture that defines the self as sovereign. Secondly, we need leaders who can focus in a culture in which we are wired for distraction. And thirdly, we need leaders who have intellectual and theological gravitas in a culture that is simplistic and polarized. So first, we need leaders of purpose in a culture that defines the self as sovereign. Modern culture is permeated with the notion that the self is the principal, if not the only, authentic moral voice. The soft drink advertisement says, obey your thirst. Who are you going to listen to? How about yourself? One catches the same drift in the appeal for iTunes, the power to select what you hear, when you hear it, when you want to hear it. It's your music, your way. The same is true of websites, websites like YouTube, which proclaims, broadcast yourself, the power of you. Dell's slogan is, purely you. <coughs> Christian Smith, a distinguished graduate of Gordon, has written extensively about the moral norms of young people. His new book, Lost in Sandrician, concludes that moral choices have become largely a matter of individual taste. It's personal, his young respondents typically respond to ethical questions. It's up to the individual. Who can say? Whatever floats your own boat. Richard Florida has pointed out that young people today conceive of leadership and success quite differently. We once imagined professional careers as a set of orderly progression over decades. The new ideal is much more quote, becoming stars of their own creation, in the vein of Michael Zuckerberg, of Facebook, or the founders of Google, a Groupon. Their calling is to follow their own passion, march to their own drummer, follow their own dream. In this world of the sovereign self, <clears throat> it is a challenge to dream of the common good and to work for it. We must nurture young people 
by reminding them that that calling is for purposes much greater than themselves. David Brooks' re recent advice to college graduates makes this point. It's not about you. It's about a cause. It's about a problem, a calling outside yourself. We call students to serve rather than to be served, to find oneself by losing themselves. That is nothing short of radical advice in the world of the sovereign self. Secondly, <clears throat> we need leaders who can focus and concentrate in a culture in which we are wired for distraction. We live in a mar marvelous age of connection, <clears throat> and it's a great allure for young people. The number of cell phones in the world in the last decade has gone from 500 million to 5 billion. And the study <clears throat> of U.S. teenagers says that uh, they text at least 50 a day, and a third text more than 100 times a day. Now, most of us have bought into the magic of this digital connection. There's a real thrill instantly to find music, news, videos, television, anything we want to do. <clears throat> Certainly, it's a pleasure to be able to read the Wall Street Journal of the New York Times on your iPad, check football scores, play solitaire, or scrabble anytime, anywhere. My entire music library is on my iPhone. Yet our mystique about digital connection also keeps us in a constant state of anticipation and interruption. Our first obligation becomes responding immediately to anyone in our network. <clears throat> William Powers has suggested in his book, Hamlet's Blackberry, that <clears throat> our attention is provisional, waiting the next summons from beyond. A faint vibration or beep is all it takes, and you go off. We have continuous partial attention. Gail Collins of the New York Times put it this way, I think it is hard to be great without the ability to concentrate. The more distractions we've built into our culture, the harder it is to develop serious thinkers and planners. And over the last 50 years, our span of attention has collapsed to that of a hyperactive gnat. So today I want to extol the virtues of being deliberate, a word derived from Latin and implying a careful weighing in the mind of important issues. Francis Bacon said, read not to contradict and confute, but to weigh and consider. Some books are to be tasted, others to be swallowed, and some few to be chewed and digested. Young leaders today need the virtue of deliberation, of stopping and chewing and digesting. Third, we need leaders who have intellectual and theological gravitas in a culture that is often simplistic. We live in a world that is marvelous for its complexity. Yet too often we see the pressing issue of us, our day in politics, culture, and the church reduced to slogans and either or, or arguments. These play well in the media and the marketplace, but do not give full account of the reality in which we live. H.L. Mencken noted his day, and I think it's ever more true for our own, for every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. <laughs> we need to form leaders who have the kind of ballast that a proper liberal arts education can provide. They need to know something about the ancient world, the Middle Ages, the democratic revolutions. They need to understand just war theory, as Senator Kerry suggested the oranges of modern constitutionalism, the history of race in America. We need them to be able to fathom an argument by economist or a political science, to relish the power of novels and poetry, to begin to think critically and write compellingly. Gordon graduates need to come to terms with the kind of thinking illustrated in the wonderful book To Change the World by Gordon graduate James Hunter of the University of Virginia. Hunter shrewdly analyzes the complicated challenge of Christians trying to be salt and light in the contemporary world. <clears throat> he suggests that for the most part, evangelical political and social engagement over the last generation has made incorrect assumptions about how culture changes. If we always start new organizations on the periphery of culture, we can never gain access to core institutions and produce real change. 
Whether or not you agree with James Hunter's conclusions, his kind of assessment is the kind of thing that our students need to learn. They also need to need theological formation so that the depth of their faith parallels the complex world that they will face. In his new book, Jesus Christ and the Life of the Mind, which John Ortberg also mentioned this morning, Mark Knoll renews his argument that the evangelical wing of the church needs to reclaim the ballast of theological tradition, the creeds and confessions of the church. Graduates of a terrific place like Gordon do need a faith to animate their life, but they also need to know something about Augustine and Teresa of Avila and Luther and Calvin and Wesley and the Puritans and Edwards. They need to know something about Catholic social teaching, theology and the role of women in the church, and about the principal debates of the 20th century, including the role of evangelical stalwarts like President Harold John Ockengay of Gordon. In short, they need more than piety, they need deep theological grounding. Today I've offered three words of advice about forming leaders of character. Leadership is not about the leader, but about service. Leadership requires focus and attention, and Christian leadership require, requires the gravitas that comes from drink, drinking deeply at the wells of the liberal arts and theology. Let me conclude with a word about the formation of students. When I reflect on my own college experience, I was influenced greatly by certain books. I remember certain of these stopped me in my tracks. I remember Luther's Bondage of the Will, H. Richard Niebuhr's Christ in Culture, or Elizabeth Elliot's No Graven Image. But what was far more important was the overall community of learning, and particular faculty members whose lives had deep impact upon me. It was what I saw lived out that made the most impact. So Michael, if we are to form leaders of character, let me encourage you and all the faculty and staff of Gordon to build in this place a very special kind of community, one in which character is lived out and made manifest. Give students a tangible example of the community that they will cherish forever, a community whose leaders model the character for which we all yearn. Let us love, not with words or tongue, but in deeds and truth. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I will speak my word. 
The investiture of D. Michael Lindsay as the eighth president of Gordon College is both a joyful and a solemn occasion. We rejoice that God has graced us with Michael, Rebecca, and their children. We rejoice that God has gifted Michael to lead and serve as Gordon. And we rejoice at the opportunity to come alongside Michael as he leads the college as president into its next chapter. As trustees, we also recognize the seriousness of this occasion. The Board of Trustees holds in trust the spiritual and academic mission, as well as the financial health of Gordon College. We are mere stewards of an institution dedicated to preparing the next generation for taking their part in building the kingdom of God. Today, by virtue of the founding charter from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, we solemnly entrust D. Michael Lindsay with the authority and position as president of the college. Michael knows, as we know, that this is a family, and this is also Christ's school, and we must all be faithful to the Lord and to his word as we do seek to educate the faithful leaders of tomorrow. And now two of the presidents who wore this mantle before Michael, Dr. Dick Gross, Dr. Judd Carlberg will present the symbol of the presidency of Gordon College. Not only does this medallion symbolize the authority of the office of the president, but at Gordon College it has a broader meaning, a mutual commitment to building Christian community. This is what we've been hearing about today as we've had presentations given to us both this morning and this afternoon. While President Lindsay will carry the leadership responsibility in this work, he will rely on each trustee, student, and faculty and staff members to join him in fulfilling the calling which he accepts with this medallion. The man who modeled this commitment for me many decades ago, President Richard F. Gross, will now place the medallion on President D. Michael Lindsay.
Several years ago, while I was visiting Boston to conduct some research, I became so turned around in downtown Boston traffic that I promised I would never drive in this city again. <laughs> so when I was selected as Gordon's president, I realized that God really does have a sense of humor, and he must take particular delight in watching me navigate downtown Boston. I mean, how many one-way streets can there be? <laughs> Truth be told, Boston is a great city. Rebecca and I have always loved legal seafood. We are becoming fast fans of the Boston Red Sox, and nothing can beat the charm of fall in New England. Although I must say, this is pretty much what the weather is like 365 days a year. <laughs> We're preparing ourselves for the snow, even the blizzards and the nor'easters. But why didn't anybody tell me about the earthquakes and the hurricanes? <laughs> of course, as an educator, I realized that Boston is a very special place. It's the global hub of higher education. Greater Boston is home to more institutions of higher learning per capita than any other city on the face of the planet. Boston proper has more college students per capita than any other city in the world. Indeed, this is a place where the world comes to study. It's interesting because I spent the last eight years as a researcher a faculty member studying the lives of people who run our country, leaders in government, business, and nonprofit life. My research tries to look at how these senior leaders use the resources at their disposal to further human flourishing and to serve the common good. My very first interview was with Dr. Richard Mao, president of Fuller Theological Seminary in 2003. And my very last interview was conducted two months ago with Harvard's president, Drew Faust. In between, I logged 400,000 miles traveling from Bar Harbor, Maine to Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. I interviewed presidents, titans of industry, celebrity icons, and chief executives of some of the nation's largest firms. And yet, as I began to interview, uh, analyze the data that I collected over the course of all those interviews, I was struck by the fact that over half of all these interviews took place on that short stretch of land along I-95 from Washington, D.C. to Boston. This is what we sociologists refer to as the power elite corridor. It's home to the political, financial, and intellectual capitals of the Western world. Now that's significant to what we are doing here at Gordon because, as it turns out, we're the only nationally ranked Christian college along that particular I-95 power elite corridor. To the extent that Christian colleges can make a difference in the halls of power, Gordon College is uniquely placed to do precisely that. And did you know that when Gordon Chapel services are held in that building over there, it's the largest gathering of evangelicals in New England? That's both encouraging and discouraging. <laughs> For nearly 125 years working with our colleagues and friends at Gordon-Conwell Seminary, Gordon College has produced tens of thousands of leaders for the church in New England and around the world. In sum, we're the flagship evangelical institution in the global capital of higher education. For many months, I have been studying Gordon College and listening to folks who are our students, our faculty, our staff, alumni, supporters, trustees, the people who love this institution. And over the course of those many months, I've concluded that Gordon College has been guided by a set of principles that direct the college's core activities. They represent our collective vocation, our raison d'etre, our reason for being. Going forward, I would like to propose that we refer to these as the Gordon Commission. They represent the mandates that we have been commissioned by God to meet, both individually and collectively. The Gordon Commission entails at least three key imperatives for the college. First, we exist to stretch the minds of talented young people, and in so doing, 
to expand the intellectual horizons of global Christianity. Many churches talk about the importance of, quote, engaging the culture as if they are on the leading edge of cultural change. Now, churches do many good things, but I have to say on this particular matter of engaging the culture, they're not always the best equipped to do that. You see, it requires you to be in conversation with the currents of lots of different things, different disciplines, different areas of public life. Cultural engagement is not a buzzword at Gordon College. It's what we do day in and day out. It happens in our laboratories, in our classrooms, in the artist studio, and in chapel. It requires to have scholars who are knowledgeable about the latest scientific breakthroughs and the historical antecedents that brought us to this particular place. Cultural engagement demands a depth of understanding and a breadth of knowledge. And that's what a place like Gordon College can provide, not just for the church, but for the world as well. Take, for instance, Professor Marv Wilson's pioneering work in Jewish-Christian relations. That's become trendy in recent years, but Marv was doing that decades before the rest of the church was thinking about Christianity's rapprochement with Judaism. In terms of the church's work at cultural engagement, Gordon College has consistently been ahead of the curve for a long time. Indeed, in the important work of the Christian community's engagement with the world of ideas, we are at the tip of the spear. I have a friend who is a world-class scholar. He's amassed some of the best empirical research on American evangelicals and has built the world's leading set of indicators on youth culture. He leads multiple centers at a Research One university, and just this week his research was positively profiled in the New York Times. My friend is Christian Smith, the William R. Kennan Professor of Sociology at the University of Notre Dame, and a Gordon College alumnus. Chris began his academic career as a Gordon faculty member, and his scholarship and teaching embodies the mind-stretching work we are about here at Gordon. Gordon's commitment to intellectual inquiry and academic excellence is a distinguishing characteristic of the institution. Going forward, I want us to leverage that strength for us to be even more effective in the years ahead. There are lots of ways we could do that, but let me just offer a couple. One, I want us to multiply the number of student-faculty research collaborations occurring on campus. I know personally that the mentoring relationship that can form between a scholar and a student shapes both parties in tremendous ways. It's one of the most powerful forms of apprenticeship that we have in higher education because it transforms an education into a relationship. And at Christian institutions, it can be a model of discipleship, one existing between student and teacher. In my own research, on the lives of the most powerful f figures who lead our society, I learned that having a faculty mentor during the college years is a better predictor of long-term professional success. It's more significant than attending an Ivy League college or graduating with honors. That's significant because it points out how a school like Gordon, where there's a close relationship between our faculty and our students, can shape the lives of young people toward greatness. Another way I hope that we can stretch the mind relates to study abroad programs. I especially hope we can do more to significantly engage the Pacific Rim and Asia. College is a time to explore big questions and pursue worthy dreams. And time abroad can be transformative in the lives of college students, both spiritually and intellectually. So I want us to do more of that going forward. The second imperative of the Gordon Commission is to deepen the faith. In a day and age when many colleges, some of whom also share our faith commitments, they're lessening their commitment to biblical and theological literacy among their students, Gordon has just added a very innovative class on theology to its core curriculum. In an era when schools are diminishing their support for campus chapel programs, I'm pleased to say that Gordon has devoted considerable resources to connecting the big question of what makes for a good life to the person of Jesus Christ. Gordon is also unusual in that following Christ has never been rele relegated to only intellectual assent 
or pietistic devotion. A.J. Gordon himself once wrote of the importance of connecting service to Christian devotion, saying, If we fully serve the Lord, the majority of the good that we do happens in such a way that we are unaware of it happening. Service overflows from us. Social justice, evangelism, and worship have always been closely connected at the institution that bears Gordon's name. And we are committed to all three at Gordon today. This is part of the wonderful heritage that I inherit from former Gordon President Harold Ockengay and two men who have become dear friends and wonderful colleagues and mentors to me, Dick Gross and Judd Carlberg. In fact, would you please join me in thanking them for their leadership legacy at Gordon. When Gordon mails out its alumni magazine, it's read in 75 different countries, representing 25 time zones around the world. Quite literally, over 20,000 Gordon alumni are serving God around the globe in their respective vocations. Members of the Gordon community have developed malaria diagnostic tests that are being used in Africa and throughout the developing world. Our graduates are doing good in places like Burkina Faso and Sri Lanka, compelled by their Christian commitments and the world's great needs. Jennifer Jakonovich is one of them. She and her husband Dano, along with some other friends, founded Karasimbi Business Partners, the first and only management consultancy of its kind in Rwanda. They work with medium-sized companies to alleviate poverty and improve communities on the other side of the world. Jennifer's passion for serving the world was ignited during her time here as a Gordon undergraduate. When I asked her about this calling to going halfway around the world, she said to me, the love of Christ compels us to use our best where the need is greatest. And that's what's taking us to Africa. In the days ahead, we're going to seek to instill that same sense of uh, Christian commitment among our students. We want an education that anchors them in Christian truth and in relevant scholarship. We want both the truth and relevance because we think that's fundamental to propel our students to finding innovative ways to serve the wider world. The Gordon Commission entails stretching the mind, deepening the faith, and third, elevating the contribution. By this I mean three things. Gordon has historically elevated the contribution it makes to its students. We're blessed. We recruit bright and talented high school students who come and spend four years of their lives with us. And consistently, we have been able to help them become better contributors to the common good after their four years with us. This is the value added that we give in a Gordon education, taking students who are great and helping them become even better. But we can do more in this regard, and going forward, we will. Second, we need to elevate the contribution the Gordon community is making in different parts of our public life. We need to elevate the way in which Gordon is making a difference on the North Shore, in greater Boston, and in American higher education. Elevate the contribution that our students make to the 300,000 other college students that are in this area undertaking their own education. I want us to elevate the contribution that our faculty make to their own scholarly guilds. Going forward, each in our own way, I hope we will elevate the contribution we are making, not just to the work we're doing here, but also for the common good. And third, this elevation of our contribution has to also apply to Gordon as an institution. I want us to elevate the role that Gordon plays in shaping the intellectual tradition and the horizons of global Christianity, and to bringing a sense of what the Bible calls shalom, to the area around us. We happen to believe that the teaching of Jesus invigorates and advances truth and beauty in such a way that everyone benefits. After all, it was Christians who invented the, the very model of the liberal arts education. 
So we have a lot to offer, and we remember that from those to whom much is given, much is expected. We're uniquely positioned to be a leavening influence in Boston and in higher education. Going forward, I want us to do that better and more consistently. I fear that some of us have convinced ourselves that New England modesty and, and propriety inhibits us from being bold and daring. As a result, we have tried to get by with limited resources and with scaled back plans. But I'm convinced that good enough never is. Going forward, if Gordon has been doing X, I want us to be doing X squared. We're already making a huge difference through some of our community engagement in the nearby city of Lynn, for example, and through managing Old Town Hall in historic Salem, Massachusetts. We're the institutional home for Christians in the visual arts, and in May, we will host the next gathering of the Christians in political science. But we can do so much more, and we will. If we want to inspire the next generation, we have to articulate a vision for serving not just our own interests, but also the interest of others. So to elevate our contribution, to really make a difference in the world, we have to ask ourselves a tough question. How can Gordon support and encourage the good efforts of those around us? How can we support and encourage them so that their efforts might be better aligned with the purposes of God and with the flourishing of our world? This wider vision of Christian service is embodied quite well in the life of George Bennett, a man I had the privilege of interviewing seven years ago. Those of you from Boston instantly recognize the Bennett name. Not only was he the treasurer of the Harvard Corporation, manager of the nation's largest endowment, but he also managed one of the very first mutual funds in our country. He's a deeply committed Christian who just turned 100. And he spent a lifetime integrating his faith into all walks of life, not as an apology, but as an asset. He's also been a very generous supporter of Gordon and Gordon Conwell. And over the years, his son Peter, has chaired our board for many years, and now his granddaughter, Lisa Bennett Forkner, serves as one of our trustees. The Bennetts have shown us how we as Christ followers can elevate the contribution that we make to the world around us. My dear friend and mentor George Gallup read from Jeremiah 29. In it, we're admonished to, quote, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which you've been carried. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. The Bennetts have been doing that for nearly a century, and our college stands on their shoulders and that of others like them as it embraces the Gordon Commission going forward. Thomas Merton once wrote, you are made in the image of what you desire, stretching the mind, deepening the faith, elevating the contribution. That's our calling. That's our desire. I pledge to do everything in my power to guide and equip the next generation of Christian leaders with a framework of faithfulness as they try to influence cultures around the world, not for the, their own interest, but for the interest of others. I hope you will join me in that effort. You see, the Gordon Commission, it's a communal endeavor. It's not a strategic plan, and it's certainly not a marketing gimmick. It's the process of weaving together our individual contributions to a larger goal of meeting the needs of those around us. It's how our individual stories relate to the larger collective mission. I first came to love Gordon College through its people. And not just any people, but through three particular people, Christian Smith, Jennifer Jakonovich and George Bennett. Writing to the church in Corinth, the Apostle Paul once said, you yourselves are our letter written on our hearts. Taking up Paul's metaphor, these three individuals represented the essence of Gordon College to me. They were Gordon's first letter to me. The scholarship of Christian Smith has stretched my own thinking the witness of Jennifer Jakonovich has deepened my own faith, and the example of George Bennett has compelled me to elevate the contribution I seek to make in the lives of those around me. 
They drew me to Gordon, even as I hope to be able to draw more folks to this fine place. May we be an institution that does this and so much more in the lives of our students and in our community. This, I contend, is our noble aspiration in fulfilling the Gordon Commission, because this is what it means to provide faithful leadership for the common good. Please remain standing and join me in singing How Great Thou Art.
like to ask Rebecca to join us up here, please. Please join me as we pray for these wonderful people we have here. Heavenly Father, Lord of hosts, wonderful in counsel and excellent in wisdom, in your great sovereignty and wisdom, you have chosen Michael Lindsay to lead us as president of Gordon College. And so it is with grateful hearts today, we pray for Michael and for Rebecca and for their family, a prayer of dedication. We pray for Michael Lindsay, eighth president of Gordon College. Lord, grant him wisdom so that he will understand righteousness and so that discretion will watch over him and understanding will guard him. Give him the wisdom with which to faithfully carry Gordon College into its next chapter, discerning how our college ought best to serve this generation. Grant him strength and endurance with which to carry on the work of your kingdom. Give him courage to lead when leading becomes difficult or lonely. May he look first to you and to your strength, for you, Lord, are Elohim, God of strength and power, the one whom even the wind and waves obey. Grant him guidance, Father, as he leads this community. May he hear you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Help him to recognize your voice and hear it amidst the din and clamor of the daily life of a college president. Remind him that he is the man you have chosen to be president of Gordon College, and that you walk faithful through his days alongside him. Provide opportunities for Michael through which he might grow and strengthen the mission and position of Gordon College. Bring him great victories and sweet successes and humility, Lord, so that all glory might be given to you. Give Michael the skills he needs to oversee difficult situations, to bring peace amidst controversy or strife, as Billy Graham has prayed for presidents. Give him a cool head and a warm heart. Mm -hmm. Grant him times of solitude amid the busyness of his days so that he may enter into a silent space with you, lean into you, be refreshed by being in your presence. He is a college president, true, but may he first and foremost remain a man of God. Protect Michael Lindsay from all harm and provide for him. Bring encouragement through your word and through your people. Surround Michael with friends and cohorts who will support and advise him and partner faithfully with him. Remind us all to pray for, encourage, and stand behind Michael as he fulfills his role as president of Gordon College. We pray, Lord, for the Lindsay family. Father, please bless and protect this beautiful family that we now call part of our Gordon College community. As Michael and Rebecca together serve at Gordon, enable them to be faithful to the calling they have at the college and faithful to doing your work day in and day out. Grant them the time they need to do their tasks and the energy and discipline they need to be wise and loving parents, full of grace and patience. Their love is strong. Continue to nurture and strengthen their relationship and protect their marriage from all harm. Be with Rebecca in a special way, for we know that she will carry much of the responsibility and pressure that Michael's position brings. Lord, show her how deeply you love her and encourage her in the many roles that she will play at Gordon. Bless her with true friends and cause her days to be joyful. Please protect and provide for Elizabeth, Caroline, and Emily. I think of them as the princesses of the Wilson house. <laughs> Supply what they need, whether it be the mundane or the miraculous. Love them with your everlasting love. May they be a blessing to the Gordon community and may they feel blessed in return as they grow up with our campus as their backyard and our students as their friends. Heavenly Father, you are the, Gord, the God of Gordon College. We have seen you bless, provide for, and protect us. Our hearts are grateful for your continued provision to us, and we thank you. Ours is a faithful past and an expectant future. 
As our institution enters a new chapter in her history, bless us as we prepare the next generation of Christian leaders for worldwide service. Make us, Lord, a community of grace, truth, unity, and love, and shape us into a people who love you and love your Son. For great is your love reaching to the heavens. May your unfailing love rest upon us even as we put our hope in you. For you are good and your love endures forever. Your faithfulness continues through all generations. We pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory. Amen. Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Now, Michael and Rebecca and all members of the Gordon College community and all who support this great cause of Christian higher education. We go forth trusting in God's promises that he is indeed able to keep us from stumbling. And he will indeed present us someday faultless before the divine throne wearing, not on that great occasion, the robes of the academy, but the robes of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so to him, the only wise God, our savior, be glory, and majesty, and dominion, and power, both now and forevermore. And all of God's people said, Amen.